The learning objective of this chapter is to become familiar with the collapse of container stows, transverse forces acting on container stacks, the effects of the lashing bridge, especially with respect to longitudinal accelerations, and inconsistencies between class rules. The forces and reactions acting on a deck-lashed container stack are as illustrated in the figure. Transverse forces introduce racking loads across the ends of container frames. However, these forces are partly resisted by the lashings and are partly absorbed by the containers themselves. Stiffer lashings and stiffer containers absorb greater loads, and it is therefore necessary to regularly tighten lashings, especially door-end lashings, on a ship at sea. Generally, the maximum lashing forces are encountered at the door ends, whereas higher racking loads can be expected at the front ends due to their more rigid structure. Toppling, or separation forces, tend to pivot a container on its bottom edge, eventually overturning it when a ship is subjected to extreme rolling. Separation, or tipping forces, act to pull out or separate the corner castings or twist locks. In the figure, the strength of the first tier container must be sufficient to resist the racking force, R, introduced into the top of it. Likewise, the tension, L, in the rod lashing should not exceed the safe working load of the weakest component in the lashing assembly, be it a turnbuckle or a pad eye. The integrity of a lashing assembly depends largely upon the integrity of pad eyes, to which the turnbuckles are secured. The wear down of pad eyes and or cracks around their welded base seams affects the integrity of the entire lashing assembly. There is no excuse for a container stack to collapse. Containers do not collapse or fall overboard due to heavy weather, although that is the reason normally cited by ship owners, masters and attending surveyors, unless the forces of weather imposed upon the lashing system exceed the ultimate strength of components. When a container collapses due to structural or lashing failure, there is a domino effect that causes the adjoining rows to topple over. During heavy rolling, this effect will continue to topple containers outwards from the heavier stacks until the ship's side is reached where, on large container ships, the allowable stack weight is usually around 82 tons. Containers will then fall overboard. Basically, many container stows collapse, often with containers being lost overboard, due to inadequate or incorrect securing arrangements, often due to a ship sailing a violation of instructions provided in the CSM, failing to exercise caution on a particular sea route during a particular season, using mixed lashings such as rogue twist locks and or wrongly color-coded lashing components supplied from another vessel, and carrying heavier over lighter containers. Other reasons why container stows collapse are due to Individual stacks being too high and too heavy, whereby the first and second tier containers, although cross-lashed to the hatch pontoons, are subjected to excessive transverse racking and compressive forces. This scenario is similar to a person carrying a very high and heavy load on his head, which would certainly result in his legs buckling under him. Using semi-automatic twist locks, heavy containers stowed high up will raise a ship's center of gravity and in heavy weather will cause the ship to roll more than if the heavy containers had not been loaded in high positions. What would then happen is that the uppermost containers could quite easily tip over during a reversal of rolling. Often heavy containers are loaded over lighter ones because of incorrect declaration of container weights made either by the shipper or the load planner ashore. Such problems routinely occur in certain ports or with certain shippers or charterers. The ship's officers play no part in this scenario. Cargo fires weaken container structures. A weakened container could collapse even if the ship did not experience heavy weather. Problems involving container fires routinely occur in certain load ports or with certain shippers or charterers.
A P&I association recently became aware of a number of separate container fires caused by charcoal products that had been shipped by the same shipper in the Far East. At least two of the incidents involved containers loaded at the same port. In one case, a container was said to contain charcoal briquettes, and in the other, charcoal alamir. The cargoes had not been declared as per the requirements of the International Maritime Dangerous Goods, or IMDG, code. Wind forces acting on a ship due to high container stacks are illustrated in some detail in cargo securing manuals. The various stack profiles exposed to wind are shown with calculations of the healing effects of wind when high container stacks are carried. Extra lashing rods must always be used as a safety precaution, and especially where recommended in the CSM. If ignored, outboard containers could be lost overboard during heavy weather and the associated wind forces. Ship's officers will never know when the cargo inside a particular container will break free of its own securing arrangements and bear heavily against the container's side walls, adding extra weight and possibly rupturing them. Nothing can be done about this on a ship at sea, but the extra lashings will assist with holding the container in its slot. Loose and inadequately applied container lashings will allow container stacks to tilt until they make contact with other containers or the upper sections of their lashing rods and or their base twist locks. This causes the overall cargo securing system to experience sudden shock loads that could exceed the safe working limits by a considerable margin. With a loose system in place, the magnitude of the shock loads will increase as the angles of roll increase. In heavy weather, constant shock loads could lead to eventual lashing failure. Several container losses have been attributed to inadequate lashings, where securing systems have been found inadequate to withstand static and dynamic loads imposed upon them. Ultra-large container ships with carrying capacities in excess of 10,000 20-foot equivalent units, or TEUs, have a low resistance to torsional deformation, especially in heavy weather, due to their wide hatch openings. Because of their enormous size, naval architects are challenged with designing such ships where structural failure is often attributed to torsional moments caused by wave action that combine with other load components in a seaway. Ship deformation in a seaway, together with associated vibrations, affects the entire container lashing system, as this places additional stresses on each component. The on-deck containers will tend to slide on their base twist locks, imparting longitudinal forces to them. The continuous movement of the containers will result in wear and tear of the twist locks. Where excessive, sliding forces can cause twist lock cracking failure. In some of the worst cases, the base of twist locks have been reduced from 30 millimeters to 10 millimeters after a few voyages only, resulting in the loss of containers overboard from outboard stacks. Containers such as high cubes, or those of 45 or 48 feet in length, when mixed randomly with standard units, cause misalignment of the container tiers. As shown in the illustration, this presents the installation of double stacking cones and bridge fittings, if required by the CSM, compromising the lashing system. The base twist locks of 45 and 48 foot long containers are particularly subjected to longitudinal forces. Some masters also do not fully understand the differences between the lashing systems in use and tend to mix the components of one system with another. This may not be widely known, and on some ships, particularly multi-purpose ships and conbulkers, greater care is needed. Stevedores, whether appointed by a ship operator or charterer, undertake to stow and secure containers, and in many parts of the world, cannot be relied upon to use sound items of container lashing and securing equipment. Stevedores will use whatever item of equipment is available, whether damaged or not, without the slightest concern as to its suitability as a lashing component. Substandard equipment will fail at a lower than designed load. If failure, such as from a twist lock, occurs low down in a stack, other areas of the stack will be severely affected in heavy weather. 
Therefore, constant supervision of stevedores by ship's officers is essential during cargo operations. Inspecting base twist locks regularly for wear down and or cracks is also necessary. People identify a lashing system by its strength and refer to a cone system with wires or a rod system with twist locks. Although lashing systems may look similar, in reality they vary enormously because each system has certain components that perform similar tasks. Every lashing system will have a connecting device, a twist lock or a cone. It is important to realize that components from one system cannot be mixed with those from another. Worn out rods cannot be replaced with wires because these two components have different strengths and characteristics. There will be something with which to tighten lashings, such as turnbuckles, and something to connect the lashing to the ship and containers, such as D-rings and penguin hooks. Lashing rods have a typical braking load of 50 tons, whilst wires have a braking load of 36 tons and chains as little as 20 tons. Twist locks have a typical braking tensile load of 40 tons and a shear load of 30 tons. Stacking cones have no tensile properties and unless used in conjunction with a pin, a cone in itself will not prevent containers from jumping. Cones must therefore never replace twist locks. Twist locks are preferred securing devices as stacking cone-based lashing systems are prone to failure, especially in heavy weather. Ship's crews should know that a twist lock behaves very differently to a stacking cone, as it is designed to hold and lock containers. Therefore, the number of lashings can be reduced accordingly. Stacking cones, on the other hand, are designed only to prevent slippage, not to hold and lock containers. The danger of containers separating and toppling is greatest when cones are used because the containers are not locked together. During condition surveys and following investigations after the loss of or damage to containers, surveyors have highlighted common problems that have contributed to failure of container lashings. It has been reported that A. D-rings were corroded under the retaining collar, often to an extent that the ring could easily be lifted out of its collar. B. Clips or bridge pieces used to connect containers transversely were used as twist locks. C. Lashing wires were poorly maintained and showed no signs of having been oiled. D. Broken double stacking cones replaced designed single stacking cones. E. Left and right-handed twist locks were mixed in the same storage bins on board. F. Warm chains had been used. G. Turnbuckles were loose and had apparently not been checked regularly. When containers are secure to a lashing bridge, the lashings extend to the third or fourth tier of containers, thus increasing the effectiveness of the lashings in resisting the overturning of containers. Because corner post tension and compression reactions are reduced accordingly, container stacks secured to a lashing bridge generally have higher permissible weights. The lashing bridge, however, becomes less effective as the longitudinal distance between it and the containers increases. This is most evident when stowing the smaller 40-foot containers in bays arranged for alternative 45-foot or 48-foot container stowage. As the ship distorts torsionally and the hatch pontoons tend to slide towards or away from the lashing bridge, the lashings will slacken and tighten alternatively and will absorb shock loads because the lashings are loose. Classification societies began developing rules for securing containers on ships in the early 1970s. Today, the major class societies have published rules covering container securing systems. In 1981, the IMO published guidelines to increase the standard of stowage and securing on board non-cellular container ships. However, despite the developments of all these years, the shipping industry still lacks a standard approach to container securing systems. Each set of rules generates slightly different results, and where non-standard containers are stowed together with standard ISO containers, the securing systems are often improvised. A classification society carries out the initial approval and certification of a particular container after which a safety approval plate is affixed to it. Amongst other purposes, the safety approval plate is meant to display a record of periodic inspections. 
Different car societies apply different vertical racking and transverse forces by their individual standards to ISO containers. Accelerations allowances on deck stowed containers therefore vary in proportion to individual class rules. From the table, it will be observed that the International Standards Organization permits bottom compression forces of 954 kN for 20 foot containers and 983 kN for 40 foot containers. However, for five identical 20 foot or 40 foot containers, each certified by a different classification society, the allowable bottom compression forces in the vertical direction vary as follows. One, Lloyd's Register of Shipping permits a vertical force of 983 kN for both 20 foot and 40 foot containers. 2. Germanische Lloyd and Denoschke Veritas do not specify permissible vertical forces. 3. American Bureau of Shipping permits a vertical force of 954 kN for both 20 foot and 40 foot containers. 4. Bureau Veritas does not specify permissible vertical forces. About 2% of all new containers are subjected to racking force loads, after which there are no further tests of a container's structural strength and or rigidity. From the table it will be observed that the classification society's permissible forces on door and front wall frames are the same as the ISO permissible forces, this being 150 kN. However, with respect to sidewall racking forces, the ISO permits 75 kN for both 20 foot and 40 foot containers, whereas the permissible racking forces by the various class societies vary as follows. One, Lloyd's Register of Shipping permits 100 kN. 2. Germanische Lloyd permits 125 kN. 3. Denoschke Veritas permits 75 kN. 4. The American Bureau of Shipping permits 125 kN. 5. Bureau Veritas permits 100 kN. The variance in permissible transverse forces can be observed from the table. Once the transverse forces acting on a particular container have been calculated, its value should ideally be compared with the forces permitted by the container's classification society. However, as it may not be possible to individually inspect all the containers on board, the information should be compared with permissible forces from the loading computer. As guidance only, different classification societies apply different safe working loads permissible by their own respective standards to various items of container lashing equipment, as follows. If lashing rods are over-tightened using hand spanners, excessive tension towards the end container frames could be unnecessarily created. The excessive compression forces could then be experienced by the containers sooner than they ought to.